Would you like to experience a shift in your career? You may be frustrated to see the same workplace patterns repeat or feel that work lacks purpose, respect, or compensation. To get relief, you may have talked with friends or family, read books, watched YouTube, or taken courses. All good strategies if you get unstuck quickly and move towards your goal. But if you're frustrated with your progress, you need an expert guide to become the hero of your own work story. And that's where I come in. My name is Marie Gervais, and I help people move from work trauma to career transformation. With a doctorate in culture and learning in the workplace, certification in emotional freedom coaching, and as a training and development professional, I've helped hundreds of stuck career professionals gain new insights and release what is not serving them. So if you're ready to turn wishful thinking into a meaningful, well-compensated career and are hungry to experience the power of coaching to get you there, let's talk. Get a taste of what career success could be for you. Go to trycoaching.link slash biz. Biz is spelled B-I-S. See you there. Hello, Culture and Leadership Connections podcast listeners. I am very happy to present to you today, Marietta Montgomery. Marietta is an organizational development manager in human resources, and she grew up in Montclair, New Jersey. She went to high school in Avon, Indiana, and has a bachelor's degree in business administration with a concentration in operations, after which she did a master's degree in marketing from Strayer University. 16 years of experience as a human resources manager has seasoned her and helped her to develop her philosophy, which is to help people seek their purpose. She believes that everyone wants to belong and have a sense of value and contribution, and that belief in oneself and one's abilities is necessary for survival. Encouragement without judgment can enable people to become great. And that is Marietta's purpose. She now works for a global manufacturing company as an organizational development manager focused on developing great leaders. She has a husband of 19 years, and together they take care of three fur babies, a Shiba Inu, an American Akita, and a French bulldog. <laughs> and she has other hobbies, including gaming and playing the piano. Welcome, Marietta. Well, thank you, Marie. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you could join us today. And the audience doesn't know, but we had quite a lot of microphone um, issues <laughs> <laughs> and computer reset issues. And sometimes the tech problems are um, indicative of a truly fantastic interview coming up. So I'm really <laughs> looking forward to our interview. Yes. So tell the audience a little bit about who you are, you know, the personal side a bit. Tell us about your family. Do you have other siblings? What was your life like when you were growing up? Okay, well, I do have uh, two siblings through uh, adoption. So I myself was adopted by my biological mother's mother. So my grandmother adopted me legally. She was also a foster mother, uh, and she decided to start adopting. So that's how I ended up with two sisters, June and Penny. Uh, they're both older. I'm still the baby. So that's kind of how I'm made up as far as family. Professionally, as you mentioned, uh, I'm an organizational development manager. And to me, I call myself a behavioral trainer. You know, there's all types of trainings out there, technical, professional, but we have to acknowledge that there's feelings and emotions in everything. And so, yes, if you look at the true definition, you, you develop employees towards the strategy of the company to make it profitable. But from my standpoint with the employee, uh, not just find their purpose, but find what drives them to success? What do they look for in their career? And bring them some type of professional satisfaction to make them feel you know, valued and part of the organization. Not everyone knows where they need to go and how to get there. That is so important because we're not machines. We're not automatons. We live in a context with other people and we need to feel that we belong and that our whole selves are recognized. So I'm so happy you're doing that. Yes. So can you take us back a little bit to your childhood? Are there a couple of incidents that stand out for you as being formative? Well, I always reference my grandmother. I'm also named after her, by the way. Mm. Uh, and I feel like I'm turning into her, which is not a bad thing. Uh, you know, I learned perseverance from her. Growing up, if there was some new policy or something that the school deemed necessary and she didn't agree with it, she would approach it. She would talk to the teacher. If she didn't like their response, she would go to the principal. And worse than the worst, she would go all the way to the Board of Education. And she's done this a couple of times with uh, different generations. Like I stated, I have two older sisters. 
And so, you know, she she taught me everyone has a boss and she's right. Uh, and she said, you know, if you really feel strongly about something and you know you're right, then you should continue and fight till you get to the top. So I I have always thought about that even in my career. Uh, sometimes ideas that I may have may not be exactly the way the company wants to go. I'll just keep rephrasing it <laughs> eventually we go there. You know, I find that balance between the business and employees. That's so great, that perseverance and also being an advocate to make sure that people concerns don't get left behind or dismissed. Just keeping on going until that advocacy reaches at least the right ears and everybody's heard it. Correct. Mm -hmm. Anything else that comes uh, to mind? Yeah, I, you know, I, I will also recall as, as people grow up or even as children, we all want something, even as adults, we all want something. Mm -hmm. But is it what you really need? So I learned that, you know, I tell my grandmother, hey, I, I'd want, you know, patch patch kid or whatever it was. And hopefully I'm not aging myself by saying that. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, as you get older, you know, she'd tell you, you're old enough for your wants not to hurt you. Is that really what you need? That's beautiful. And as I've gotten older and an adult now, I do think about that. What are the things that I really need versus what I want? And which one is priority? So typically I go with needs and wants, I gift myself later after taking care of things that you need in your life that are necessary. I always say people spend their money on what they want. And for me, money is not easy to come by. So I like to make wise decisions. And so, you know, I do treat myself here and there, but it is really a true focus uh, for me to spend money wisely. Hmm. It sounds like your grandmother was a wise woman and you are also a wise woman as a result. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> so from the groups you were born into, you know, we're all born into um, locality. We're mm -hmm. born into a region, a nation, a race, a language, religion, and just ways of thinking and being in the world. We're born into that. We didn't choose it. We just happened to be there. And so what would you say still influences you today from those groups? Whichever groups would, stand out for you. I think region stands out the most because I've moved so much. Mm -hmm. So most of my family were for Federal Express. We started in New Jersey, then Indiana, and then they ended up in Memphis, Tennessee. I obviously didn't choose that route, but as those moves were happening, I was a little too young to put my foot down, so I have to follow. Uh, but, you know, New Jersey, Indiana, Tennessee, Alabama, Arizona, and now Texas. I think I've been exposed to a lot of different people, regions. I've also worked globally. Uh, that's also exposed me to different cultures. And I think what I've learned is remain open-minded and be sensitive to others from all areas. Some areas are stronger with family, I would say South America. And so what it's taught me is before you ask for what you need from someone, check on them as an individual. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that and made your connections, then you move forward. But it's something kind of pushy if you just go directly into give me this or I need that report. It's very different when you build a camaraderie and rapport with the person and check in on them first. After that, you can get everything that you need. That's true. That's true. But when you were younger, you didn't know that. So when you were younger, what would have influenced you? Uh, what stands out as being a more specific incident is what I'm looking for. I think the most specific incident probably would have been race. I was the only African-American female in my high school. And I recall going home kind of shocked because growing up in New Jersey, you're exposed to every culture and race. And literally it was me. And then everyone was Caucasian. Hmm. Uh, not well received. For the first couple of years, um, almost like I was an alien. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, called me the N-word. A lot of bad things happened. And I go home and tell my grandmother about it. And she literally said to me, welcome to corporate America and get ready. Really interesting. Yeah. That's a good way to build resilience, I guess. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that stood out. And from that point forward, I learned it's what you know. It's not what you look like. It's not whether you're male, female, it's about what you know and what you bring to the table. And who you know to allow you to be able to bring that to the table. Yes. Because if it were just what you know, we would have no inequities in the hiring field. 
Oh, no, you're correct. You are so <laughs> correct there. So, yeah, you know, and, and you know, networking is very necessary, but you've got to be comfortable in your own skin mm-hmm. and not afraid to have those conversations and approach the right people. Mm-hmm. When I first met you, and I'm trying to remember how we did it somehow on LinkedIn, but the first time I talked to you, I thought, what a fearless woman. I was thinking, <laughs> she's fearless. There's nothing that scares her. <laughs> Would you say that developed when you were in that most uncomfortable experience of being the only black woman in a white school in high school? Or what did it start before that? Nope, that's where it started. Mm -hmm. That's where it started, especially when she told me, like, welcome to corporate America. I'm like, oh, so this is what it's going to look like when I get older and I take a job. I probably will be the minority. And I became comfortable in that. And I will admit, I started off in athletics and I thought, well, if I'm going to be the only black female here, I'm going to switch over. So I got into academics and I thought I'm going to be the smartest black female that you know. Um, And so I dropped the athletics, got into academics and joined the newspaper staff. I had my own column called From My POV and I shared how I felt being at that school. I was super bold. I wanted them to know who I was. You want them to remember you more like who you were instead of who they were projecting onto you. Exactly. And I will say I became the cool kid once there was a dance. I love music. And the cheerleaders needed help. (laughs) They saw me dancing. I became the cool kid after that. And so, you know, I I would help with their routines. And the newspaper call became very popular. And I think by my third year, I was accepted as Marietta. You know, you totally aced that situation. You just rocked it. (laughs) I think you just decided I'm going to take charge. If I can't belong, so what? I'm going to take charge and make my own game. Yep, that's what happened. (laughs) So what about groups that you then chose? I mean, you said you've worked in other countries and also moved around quite a bit in the United States. So there's also hobbies, you know, like gaming that can be also a community. So can uh, uh, playing the piano and being a musician, being a dancer. So what kinds of things that you grew into or that you chose, would you say have been formative for you? I'm kind of all over the place, to be honest, Marie. I talked about a couple of hobbies, but what I do when I meet people, I feel like there's always something that I can find in common, whether it's weather, whether it's music, there's something that we all have in common. And so That's kind of my thing. It it doesn't necessarily mean my hobbies, but what is it that can get another person to engage with me, especially if they don't know me at all? Mm -hmm. And so I will ask sometimes, what is the other person into and find my way there? So I, I don't know if I've answered that the way you were thinking, but that's typically my approach. I do believe that everyone has something in common if they take the time to have that conversation. You remind me, Marriott, of my dad who did the same thing, coming as an immigrant and he decided what he was going to do is find something in common with every person that he met. And that was something I learned from him. And uh, I think that I've developed it more as an adult. It sounds like you also have continued to develop that skill. It's necessary. You know, I, I don't know everything. And, you know, I've been in organizational development for about a year and a half now. So it is a new world for me to an extent. And so I reach out to other professionals like yourself or, you know, other people that have had more experience in this area to continue to develop myself so that I can be good at what I do. I need to continuously grow. I need to continuously educate myself so that I can deliver what other people need from me. Mm -hmm. I think what I was thinking about when I asked that question is more like things that you've actually chosen to Uh, adopt into the way you do things. And um, I've mentioned this maybe on another podcast before, but I have a a lot of experience with Persians. And there's Persians have a certain way of greeting you that makes you feel very respected and very welcome. It's an attitude of hospitality. And whenever they come into a room, they will make sure they greet every single person individually. And you can't, if new person comes in, they have to greet everybody individually. It's just, it's just a kind of a routine. And before I had met any Persians that didn't occur to me that you would do something. You just come in, sit yourself down and try to figure out what's going on. But this to me seems so much more respectful and such a much better acknowledgement. And I found that I started to adopt that into the way I was doing things. Every once in a while, I still fall back into the North American way of jump in and get started without really 
acknowledging respectfully the people around me, but mostly I have adopted that into my behavior. So I'm asking you, is there something okay. you, have, you have consciously tried to adopt into your behavior? Well, honestly, what you just said, is kind of what I do. So for example, it's a little deeper than that for me. As I stated, everyone has their purpose. So if I'm going to a location, I'm greeting every person I see, whether they're in the room that I'm going to or not. So if you're the janitor, I'm greeting you and seeing how you're doing because you're keeping the facilities clean and you matter just like everyone else. I literally talk to every person I make eye contact with. Right. You are ready. Yeah. We're doing that. That's not something new that you chose to do to change your own That's behavior true. with. So what I'm saying is oh, what have change. you actually tried to change your own behavior with? Because if we're, Ooh, if this change. happens, people who are in human resources or who are in it, who are in learning and development, they're always trying to get other people to change their behavior. But if they can't change their own, they're not going to be that effective. So what have you done that's been a change of behavior? Um, even for me, another thing would be just to give you an idea. I was not athletic. I didn't do anything athletic as an adult. I chose to change my behavior and become a workout person. And I started going to different, you know, exercise classes and started to take my physical self seriously. I had to work at it because it didn't come naturally to me. But that has now become a behavior that I just have. I just every day, that's what I do. You know, so is there something you've done that you have consciously changed your own behavior with? The only thing that comes to mind is the furthering of education. While I was doing that as an HR manager, not quite as intense now as an organizational development manager. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like there's a sense of urgency for me to stay on top of several things that I may or may not know. So, for example, I literally am reading three books at one time because I'm working with lean manufacturing, and there is a certain way to talk to people from the organizational standpoint that I didn't think about before. Yeah, um, language for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that in the past, I've kind of just felt like I had it going on, you know, I just keep going with my own emotion and feelings. Now I'm actually referencing documents. If it's an area I don't understand, reaching out to a subject matter expert to get further information versus just clicking through a slide because the information is there. And so I think right now I'm going through further education. No one's telling me to do it. Everyone's saying things are fine. But for me, I just feel an urgency. And so that is a change of behavior. I might read one book a, a year versus three at one time. It, so I think that's the huge shift for me. Also technology. I am not a social media person. And so now there's all these different methods of Yammer and different ways to get to people within the organization, learning how to use these and making sure that I'm on every aspect of communication. That's a big change versus as an HR manager, you're just talking to this group of people. So I think my change of behavior is just further education. I like the way you said that. You know, there's learning, uh, there's changing your behavior to read all the time, to grasp the new terminology and language and understand it so you can speak from a position of solidarity, right? And then also being able to use different technology channels, which is for sure, those are things that would change your behavior and you would have to make that change. Those are great examples. Um, what about temperament and personality? So temperament you're born with and personality you add on through overcoming obstacles, like your explanation, I think, of what you did in high school. But there might have been some element of temperament to that, too. And then also, of course, the influence of your grandmother being tenacious and determined. But um, what would you say is your baseline temperament and what have you added on personality wise? I'm very welcoming and gregariously welcoming. Mm -hmm. I am very excited all the time. And so that is who I am. I want to be approachable. I want to make people feel comfortable so that, you know, if they want to talk to me about something, they're willing, they're open. I think the more you can make someone feel comfortable without judgment, I always have to say that the more you find out about them, mm -hmm. the more you can learn. I feel like we can all learn from one another. Uh, so I just try to remain humble. And I do believe in a family approach. And I've learned over the years, family doesn't mean blood. It's literally people that make you feel that you can be your authentic self mm -hmm. and, and truly care about your well-being. And so I kind of take that approach. How are you doing today, Marie? Versus, mm -hmm. hey, we're here to have this meeting. Let's get on this podcast. You know, it, it's very important to check on the being. And from that point, people let down their guard and, and they'll give you more than what they 
probably would have if you had a different approach. So I would say welcoming and gregarious. Hello. (laughs) And enthusiastic. Yes, very much so. (laughs) Um, And then afterwards, I don't know, sometimes as people get older, they tend to temper some of their extremes. Is there anything you feel you've tempered that's part of your personality? I would say I learned more patience. Mm -hmm. I'm not judging anyone from New Jersey, but I will tell you, we move fast. We want things like yesterday. Mm -hmm. And as I've gotten older, I have to recognize everyone learns at a different pace. Everyone thinks differently. So I've had to learn patience and temper down my impatience or expectations of right now. Yes, we would still have a deadline and, and you try to meet those, but having some more respect for others' time and others, the way they think, and that's something that I've definitely tempered. I see. Uh, So can you recall a time when you felt that your cultural understanding was specific to your experience and not the norm? I mean, the high school experience for sure would have been one. First, you're in a diverse environment and then you're the only black female in this whole high school. So that would have been a culture shock for sure. But can you think of any others? So as I mentioned, you know, typically I am the minority and it doesn't bother me. But I have been in some interesting situations in the workforce where it's definitely reared its head. doesn't bother me, but obviously someone else. I will tell a funny story. Very excited about this particular job. I'm going to work as an HR manager. And I felt like our team was a melting pot. My boss was Caucasian. My HR generalist was Vietnamese. And the safety manager, he was Hispanic. So I thought that was great. However, it wasn't great for all. They had been together as a team for several years. I was the newbie and I literally was approached by my HR general that stated, why did they hire you? You're black. I honestly felt bad for her. Hmm. It was specific, but to me, it wasn't normal. No. So I felt bad for her. I, it didn't offend me, which was a sad thing. I, I, at this point, I've got pretty tough skin, but I did say to her, well, just so you know, I'll be back tomorrow. And the skin will be the same. <laughs> what a great comeback. <laughs> that was pretty much it. Uh, we probably worked together for another year or so before I had another opportunity that was just better for me. Mm-hmm. There was another time where I was promoted. And the previous leader had been there for several years. He was a Caucasian male. And one of the one of the managers just felt extremely uncomfortable, which was a little shocking because I knew this manager from another location. And they seemed perfectly fine with me until I became their HR Ah. and literally just threw a fit one day before I even said a word. We were just talking about, I was talking about a policy that I wanted to implement to help the location. And the way I go about a policy, it's not Marietta's policy. It's going to be our policy. So I start with the supervisors, then I go to the manager. So it takes about 90 days but I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. I even include the employees at the very end to make sure they feel that it's fair treatment. So I was at step one. He's one of the managers. And I lay the policy down. And I don't say a word. He just starts yelling and screaming. Who do you think you are? You're not going to make changes here. It was crazy. And I looked at him. And in my mind, I had several things going. I'm just looking at him. In my mind, I thought, man, if I say something, they're going to say, Marietta, you know better your HR. Or... Oh, she just can't handle it. It's too big of a job. Several things are going through my head. It's this gentleman's just yelling and yelling. And I just decided to stand up. I point to his toes and I run my finger up to his head. And I said, I'm not doing this right now. And I just walked out of the room. Nice. I never yelled. I never raised my voice. Once again, felt sorry for him. (laughs) And, you know, we ended up having a meeting. And he literally said, there's nothing she's done. It's just too much change for me. Hmm. And literally said he almost wanted to quit over it. Too much change just can't handle being under a black boss, I guess. Apparently. (laughs) Apparently, yeah. And he knew who I was. We had known each other for some years, but this role was just very uncomfortable for him. You know what, Marietta? That makes me think of people whose kids play together across races constantly and they're good friends. And then they decide to get married and their parents are all up in arms. You can't marry someone of that race. Yeah, you're right. As soon as it gets too close or above you, then that's when the real racism underneath jumps out to bite you. Yeah. If you didn't know it was there before, that's a good time to face it. Right. And honestly, I did make the comment. I said, I understand I'm not an older white gentleman, but I've earned my place here. You sure have. that was my response. Yeah, that's right. 
It's really his problem, not yours. I think you handled those really nicely. Those are, that'd be great in a movie, both those scenes. <laughs> <laughs> so with the high school scene, I'm like, I'm thinking you should go for the movie script coming up soon. <laughs> well, you know, there's stereotypes and I refuse to feed into those. Good for you. And I think in situations where we can do that, I think we really need to. Like if you were in a country where the dictator would just shoot you, that might not be the option. But where you are, you have some control and you have a margin of latitude that you can use. And I just want to congratulate you for using it so wisely. Again, this wisdom thing just keeps popping up for me. My thanks. So uh, we're reaching the end of the interview and I wanted to ask you, when people work with you, what brings out the best in you, Marietta? What do you need to be at your complete best? I always tell people, just be real. <laughs> you know, be transparent, be vulnerable with me so that I can truly help. You know, the more that people let you in, the more you can be of service. So, you know, once again, it's so important to no judgment, open up, let's talk about it, let's strategize. And the whole goal is to move forward and find your happiness. You know, you can't please everyone, but you have to at least attempt to understand and try to come to at least a happy medium. Mm -hmm. What do you do if sometimes the judgment is just really overwhelming? You certainly wouldn't act on it, but within yourself, how do you release that? You know, sometimes I will write out my feelings mm -hmm. on paper. I literally will write it out because I don't, I, I refuse to fall into a trap. I refuse to show some type of something different outside of who I truly am. Mm -hmm. I am a very happy person. I'm positive. So to maintain that, sometimes I will write out my frustrations. And then once I've written it to where I can't write anymore, sometimes I write over the words over and over till I get it out. I throw it out and I feel better. That's beautiful. That's a great way to do it. You know, I think when people have lots of difficulties to overcome in their lives, and, and there is no HR director that isn't facing difficulties every day, it stays in your body and, and can be a, a negative a residue that causes all sorts of issues later on, unless you discharge it. And I think your writing strategy, and especially like the idea of writing over top of the words and then mm -hmm. throwing it out, I think that's a really nice one. I hope other people take that uh, and use that idea. It's something about when you put something on paper, it does feel like a release to me. And writing over it is how you're getting to move forward. You're, you've got to get out of this funk, whatever you're in, and throwing it away is saying, I'm going to move forward. I've got to let that go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to try that. I've never thought of writing over top of it, but I'm going to try that. I think that's a brilliant It idea. looks crazy by the time you're done, but you feel so good. Yeah, yeah. You're overwriting your life. You're going, I am bigger than this. You have I to see. be because others are depending on me. So mm -hmm. how do I get me back? You know, yeah, I don't yeah. think I have that luxury of staying in this weird spot when people are depending on my positivity and my my advice and those kind of things. So I have to stay at a good space. You know, yeah. even when I do my trainings, I the first question I ask everyone is how do you prepare yourself for the day? There has to be some type of ritual where you give yourself you time to prepare yourself for what's to come because you don't know. And then the next question is, when things, I have air quotes like you can see me, come your way, how do you handle that? Whether it's a deep breath, do you take a walk? Because you have to stay enrolled. Because as a leader, you are being watched. And that's what it means by lead by example. Those are two great examples for people. You know, how do you start your day? How do you set yourself up? so that you've got that me time? And then how are you going to set yourself up for dealing with the issues that are going to come up so you can still be at your best? That's great. This is your soapbox moment. Is there something you'd like to promote? No, necessarily. I'm just very excited to have this opportunity and share a little bit about who I am. My hope is that whoever's listening in, uh, that they think about how they lead. If they're not a leader, think about what traits and and temperament what they have to succeed in that. I just wanted to share kind of how I feel about the world and leadership because like I said, emotions matter. And what I always try to tell people, you know, some people say, why can't they just do what I ask them to do? I don't want to deal with their problems. Well, their problems are your problems to an extent. 
And, you know, depending on what field you're working in, if you want accuracy, you want safety, you want productivity, those things can be affected if you do not care about the person sincerely. I'm not saying go too deep, meaning, you know, if it gets too deep, maybe you have HR and EAP, you know, employee assistance program, but at least get to know them at a level that they feel comfortable enough to share. Right. It will be so much easier as a leader to be able to get what you need from people as well as feel good about yourself and how you approach people because you you should be treating people how you want it to be treated. Mm-hmm. It's more humane and respectful and and also it allows the unnecessary resistance to dissolve so that when resistance comes up that you need to pay attention to, you can see it. Otherwise, it's like the forest for the trees. You are so correct there. So is there anything else you'd like to say before we end today? No. I just really appreciate this opportunity and I look forward to you and I continuing to stay in touch and nope, I have nothing else I would like to say. It's been lovely, Marietta. Thank you so much for this time together. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Marie. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Marietta Montgomery has rare insights into what makes people feel safe and acknowledged at work. Her lifetime experience of seeking commonalities, bridging differences, and setting respectful boundaries started with the experience of being the only minority during high school. Deciding more and more consciously to find and take charge of her margin of control, Marietta now always leaves people and organizations better than how she found them, happy and productive with fond memories of their work with her. An inspired people person, she's at her best in roles of training and development. As a manufacturing leadership developer, Marietta takes people from where they are and adds her blend of grit and humanity to encourage them into their next steps, while doing the same learning herself. If you enjoyed this episode, please do share it with a friend or colleague. And while you're on the website or podcast channel, I would be most grateful if you would leave a rating and review. Thank you for listening, and may culture and leadership connections continue to guide and inspire your day. Want to show some appreciation? You can buy me a coffee. What? How do you buy a coffee for a podcast owner? Well, there's a way. Let me explain. You go to buymeacoffee.com slash Marie Gervais. That's spelled M-A-R-I-E-G-E-R-V-A-I-S. So it's buymeacoffee.com slash Marie Gervais. And when you go to that website, what's going to happen is you'll get a chance to click on one, two, three, four, or five cups of coffee at $5 a piece to help contribute to the cost of the podcast. And yes, it's $5 for a cup of coffee because it's quality coffee for a quality podcast. So I hope you will contribute and you'll help us to reduce the costs of the podcast by going to buymeacoffee.com slash Marie Gervais. Thank you in advance for your generous contribution.